Yom Kippur's Purim is huge, my friends. And we're going to learn tonight how to tap into the energies. But before that, let's give you a brief, brief history, just for those who don't know too much about Purim. I'll try and summarize the Purim story in 60 seconds. Because if you really want to know it, maybe just check out Chabad.org and look up the Purim story. Nice to see you, Sandra, in Turkey. What's up? We've got, we've got two Turkey again tonight. Nice Berta and Sandra. Do you know each other, Sandra and Berta? You should become like best friends. Go and have coffees with each other. Fun. And, Hi, um, everyone. Nice, nice to see you. So, Purim Sameach. So briefly, Purim in 60 seconds. Here we go. Anyone know when it happens? Anyone guess? If I, if I go... Um, Wants to play, who, who wants to be a millionaire for a moment? Did the Purim story happen 3,374 years ago? A. B. Was it 2,874 years ago? Or C. Was it 2,374 years ago? What do you reckon? A, B, or C, anyone? What are you going for? You can message me in, in, on Facebook. How long? Or you can ch put, it, put the chats of me in, in, in the Zoom. The answer is, nice to see Dino on Instagram. The answer is, my friends, C. It was 2,374 years ago did the Purim story happen. Which, by the way, sounds a long time ago, but if you think about it, it's kind of 60 generations. It's not that long. It's not that long ago. And essentially, very briefly, the temple, the first temple was tragically destroyed on the 9th of Av. We got exiled into Babylon, into Bobel by the rivers of Babylon. And then we are now, it's, it's 50 years after the destruction of the first temple. We're now all living, very, all the Jewish people are living in Iran, around that small area. And the king is Achashverosh, and his number two is on Instagram tonight, called Homon. And essentially what happened was there were very wicked people who hated the Jewish people, hated Judaism. They used tap the goblets and the vessels of the Bet HaMikdash for this huge party, by the way, first and foremost, if you think you like partying, and I know my friends in Tel Aviv like partying, but Akashverus likes a party like no other. There was a 180 day party for his citizens. They had a 180 day party. And then they invited the Jewish people to be the party for that long, just to the final seven day party. So if you think like a party, like for us, we get tired after an hour, but can you imagine we had seven days of partying and, and but it was a spiritually very flawed party. They were trying to get us to sin as much as possible. They understood if they got us to sin, we're going to be susceptible to, to be, Hashem won't be happy with us if we sin. They got us to drink from the vessels of the temple. They got us to have non kosher. They, got, they, they seduced the men. And essentially then this first bizarre event happened at the party where Ahasuerus called his queen to come who was having her own private women's only party, the very firm in those days, having the woman's only party. And he invited Vashti the queen to come and parade in front of him and his crew. And she didn't want to. And in the end, mistake, big mistake, because he chopped off her head and he killed her. Don't mess with Ahasuerus. And then he's now a vacancy as the queen. And they decided for an episode of X Factor to, to find the prettiest woman in Shushan. And unbelievably, or maybe believably, if you saw Esther, she, she was the winner. This Rebetzin, who, according to the Midrash, was perhaps was not just the niece of Mordechai, according to some opinions, was actually the wife of Mordechai, but she was a prophetess. And, and obviously it was Hashem who gave her the victory of becoming the queen of, of the, literally half the world. At the beginning of the, uh, the Megillah we're going to read tomorrow night, he owned 127 provinces from Africa to India. He, he owned it all. And essentially, she becomes the, the, the queen. Homon, unfortunately, with Ahasuerus, make their play to try and destroy us. The reason why we celebrate is, we, to be honest, it's amazing to do this to you tonight on the 13th of Adar. That was the night the lottery fell. It fell on tonight, it fell on the 13th of Adar. That's why we fast tomorrow, because really we should have been destroyed and we only didn't get destroyed because we repented. We fasted and we did Teshuvah, so connect to that. For those who are healthy enough to be able to fast, we, it's a fast day tomorrow for those who can handle it. And at least, at the very least, do repentance, because the Rambam says even more important than fasting is doing Teshuvah, is, is repenting. And Homon cast lots, 
to decide when to kill the Jewish people. It came to that in the Badar, the king signed the seal, bang, the Jewish people are going to be killed. That was it, done. And we were all in a small area, unlike the Holocaust, where the Jewish people were scattered, thank God, in the four corners of the world. That's why we're here to tell the tale. At that time, if God forbid they would have exterminated us, that, would, that was it. They could have literally got rid, God forbid, of every single one of us. We were super close 2,374 years ago to, to that could have been the end of the Jewish journey. And logically and intuitively should have been. Coincidence after coincidence, hidden miracle after hidden miracle. In the end, thank God, Queen Esther saves the day and invites. She has two parties. That's one of the reasons we have so much wine. Started with parties, concludes with parties, drinking wine. Esther calls us in. She calls Homon Achashverosh and says to Achashverosh, King, and she's really talking to Hashem when she says King, because whenever she is tomorrow night, when you read the Megiddo, when it just says the King, it's referring to Hashem. It's the only book in the whole Bible where God's name isn't mentioned. It's all hidden. So look out for it when it says the King. And it will say, Esther says to the King, Nafshi Bishelosi, I'm asking for my life. There's someone who's trying to kill me and my family. And Achashvera, she didn't realize who, that she was Jewish and loved Esther very much. Thank God. Said, who's trying to kill you? Who? Can't believe it. And someone's going to try and kill the queen? Impossible. And she said, actually, that guy right opposite you is trying to kill me. And then Homon realized he's really in trouble because he didn't know either Esther was Jewish. And he then went and, and they were lying on these beds, reclining on these beds. He went over to her bed and started begging. And then Akashvera says, you're trying to actually be with my queen in front of me. And, and that was it. Done. Homon was done. The gallows that he prepared for Mordechai, he in the end got hung on those gallows. But even though it was the demise of Homon, even though somehow he's come on Instagram tonight, but but, but if he comes on Zoom, I'm really freaking out. But the signed and sealed approval for the army to come and kill us was still green lighted, and we still had to fight this miraculous war where, again, a bunch of rabbis managed amazingly, miraculously to defeat the whole army, and we won a war. And on the 14th of Adar, we celebrated, and we celebrate in the following manner, everybody. These are the mitzvot to be doing. Wednesday night, stroke Thursday. Wednesday night, the mitzvah number one is to hear the Megillah. Okay, that was one of the first um, laws that we put in as a result of the Purim story. You hear the Megillah twice. And by the way, the mystics say when you hear the Megillah that the gates of heaven are wide open. It's like being under the chuppah and tremendous, you can make prayers. At the end, just at the end of the Megillah makes a few prayers for the things that you want in life. It's a very, very opportune time to pray. That's number one. Then the next mitzvot you do, we hear the Megillah again on Thursday. And then it's fascinating how the way we celebrate Purim is through the community spirit and through solidarity and unity and oneness and kindness. And we give shalach manot ishtarei We give food parcels. We give two types of food to two people. Number one. And then we give, and if anybody wants to give me, I'm very happy. And number two, you matanot levyonim. We give we give gifts to the poor, specifically money, which they can buy Purim food for that day. So if anybody wants a, some links of where you can give money and then they will distribute to the poor people that day, send me a message and I'll send you some links to make sure that the money goes that day to, to people that, 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 that need it for the Purim meal. That's part of the mitzvah. And then the mitzvah is gonna be to have a big meal, to have meat, to have bread, and what we're going to see about to that, to get absolutely smashed, to get drunk. And we have to work out why, oh why, oh why, would Hashem want us on the holiest day of the year to get totally drunk? Surely that's actually not a spiritual activity. That's normally, you see people very, very drunk out on Saturday night or Friday night or Thursday night, and it's not normally a very nice sight. And there's not a lot of mitzvahs going on. There's not a lot of holiness going on. Normally, drunkenness is associated to actually to criminality or to crime or to vulgarity. Why on earth would Hashem want us to drink? But yet, the Talmud says in Talmud Megillah, page seven, Chayiv inish libesume. It's incumbent upon humanity to get intoxicated. The Puria, which I'll get into in a minute with Purim, until until you no longer know the difference between Haman is cursed 
in Baruch Mordechai. Mordechai is blessed. Fascinating, and the Code of Jewish Law brings that as a law. So first of all, and, and hopefully you, you've now understood part of the answer, it says, Chayv Inish Libesume, the Puria, you should get drunk with Purim. On a deep level, we're not asking you, it's not like have a night out and get hammered. That's not the point of Purim. The point of Purim is to go to a place which you, not, you, you, not, you never normally are. So we're going to speak about it tonight, to ascend, to transcend to an incredibly high, incredible place with the energy of Purim. There's an energy of Purim, which we're going to speak about shortly. And it's that which we need to get intoxicated with, which we'll learn about in a minute. So the question I have for you tonight is what's so special about Purim? The Kedushas Levi, the Bedicheva, explains that Purim is a little bit like a king who says to his citizens, I am opening up my treasure house today. You can come and take whatever treasure you want. But yet most people are sleeping. Most people are continuing with their daytime. And a few people come and ask for some treasure. And the Kudushas lady says, if people really realized what you can access on Purim, it would be the biggest game changer of your life. You can achieve the same levels that you can on Yom Kippur on Purim. But it's absolutely fascinating because what we can do on, on, on uh, make sure you're muted, everyone. Someone's not muted. Um, on Purim, it's fascinating, even though it's a festival, but yet we, we eat, we drink, we can go in the car, we can work. So it's super deep. It's super deep why that happens. In other words, it's, it's concealed. The, the secrets are concealed, my friends. The treasure te- chest is concealed, but it's, we can access it if you want it to. We can access it if you want to. So why is it higher than young people? Question one. Question two, there's a Talmud in, in Yerushalmi and Megillah, which says the following. Rabbi Yochanan says, Hanavi Makatsuvim, that the eventual, the books of the, the prophets and the scribes, in the end, when Mashiach comes, we're not going to learn them. They're going to be libatel, whatever that means. They're going to be nullified, whatever that means. We're, they're not going to be as prominent. What will be prominent will be the five books of the Torah. When Mashiach comes, we're going to learn that. And the book of Esther, Megillah Esther. So something very special about Megillah Esther, more than any book in the second part of the Bible, question one. And then it says that actually the laws of Purim will be the first festival when Mashiach comes. That will be, of all the festivals, the most prominent messianic day. So again, what's so special about Purim, it seems, and if anybody goes to like a a Jewish area over Purim, it seems anything but holy, it seems bonkers. A lot of people dressing up, doing a lot of silly things. You know, there's gonna be a lot of um, drinking going on. And it seems that there's not a lot of holiness. It's very different to the Yom Kippur look, let's just say. So what what really is, is going on? So tonight it's gonna be very Kabbalistic, very deep. It's gonna be hopefully a bit of, shifts in in how you perceive things but before we get to the drinking part let's just get to the purim part very briefly why do we call it purim so yes there's an aspect of kapara there'll be an aspect everybody of atonement in the purim story in other words it comes from the yom kippur of kapara so there's an element of atonement on purim it's a very important time to do to show for everybody make sure you do some repentance over purim when you find a time maybe to pray, it's important you do repentance. But it doesn't actually mean that. The word Purim, anyone like to, to put in what it actually means? What does Purim mean? What does the word Purim mean? Anyone? Very good at it. Lots. Lottery. So it says that Homon, the way he chose to destroy us was by a lottery. And actually, the mystics say, the Talmud says he actually threw dice. He cast dice to decide the day he was going to kill us. So why are why are we calling our holiest day of the year by the mechanism that our wicked enemy, the awful wicked Homon, wanted to kill us? By the way, every time I say Homon, you can boo. I don't mind that as long as you're on mute, right? You can, you, you, you can bang your legs and you can wave the Gregor. 
So remind me at the end, I've got a beautiful idea about the Gregor. So question is, why do we name our holiest day of the year after the mechanism that our arch enemy wants to kill us? It's, you know, the day of Purim, if I was naming the day, I would have called it Nitzachon, victory, celebration, happiness, joy, solidarity. I wouldn't call it lotteries. And why the lotteries? Why not lottery? So Rebheim Friedlander, a student of Rob Dessler, gives the following very, very deep answer. Very briefly, it goes like this. Homon specifically took a lottery. Why? Because Homon's philosophy, my friends, was to kill ethical monotheism. He didn't believe in divine providence. He didn't believe that everything that happens is from Hashem. He wouldn't have believed, he would have wanted you to look at the Ukraine war right now, what's going on, as just an unfortunate episode, random, unlucky for the Ukrainians. He looks at things in, in, in the realms of luck. He believes in the notion of luck. So have you, do you ever use that word? Oh, you got really lucky. Or you got really unlucky. I'm asking you tonight, don't use it. Don't use it. And if you say, no, no, but surely we use the same with mazal. Mazal is the opposite. When someone gets engaged, we don't say you were lucky. That'd be really rude. Wouldn't that be rude? If someone gets engaged, oh my gosh, they were so lucky. How did you manage that? That would be super rude. What we say is mazal to. You had a beautiful flow of energy. Mazal means a flow. From the word yizal, nozel, which means to flow. So we don't believe in luck. Come on, though, believed in luck. And he essentially wanted to kill God through the concept of luck and randomness. And we know that from his forefathers, the, the wicked Amalek in the Torah. The first time it says that Amalek comes to, to encounter the Jewish people, it says, Ashekar Chabaderech. They just happen to be on the way. So actually, Mordechai's nickname for Amon was the grandson of coincidence because he was claiming everything's coincidence. He was claiming everything's random. We, my friends, don't believe in randomness. We don't believe in coincidence, but Homon did, and he thought the lottery could kill Jews and Judaism. But how wrong was he? How stupid was he? Because actually, when you, if Homon would have decided through his brain, when's a good day, day to kill the Jewish people? Do you know what I would have, I would never obviously have advised him, but he should have been advised by someone intelligent the ninth of Av is a pretty good day. That's the day when our temple was destroyed. That's the day when we had the spies, the 17th of Tammuz, the golden calf. That's the time when we're susceptible. Adar is the best day for the Jewish people. Best month for the Jewish people. It's the most wonderful month. It's awesome. It's Misha Nechmas Adar Marvin Besimcha, which by the way, the mystics explain, what does it mean when Adar comes in? There's a lot of joy. I don't know if many, may, have you felt the joy this month? It's been a very tough month for many people. So one of the reasons we haven't felt the joy enough is Mishanichnas Adar, which means Adar has got to enter you. You've got to allow Adar to enter you. We have to learn in spirituality, my friends, how to become fused with spirituality, how to really access the Wi-Fi code. It's, it's not that we enter Adar, it's that Mishanichnas Adar. Adar has to enter our heart and our soul. And if, if it would, my friends, then we'd be extremely extremely joyous so here's the reason my friends why we call it Purim because Hashem is saying I'm in charge of the lottery you see when you do a lottery it's only Hashem when you make decisions then it's complicated what's you what's Hashem what's you what's Hashem right but my friends when when um When we do a lottery, it's only Hashem. So I've got a very big question for you. Why don't we just live our life by the toss of a coin? So for example, let's say you don't know what to do. Should I marry Debbie or Mandy? So I say Debbie is heads, Mandy is tails. Hashem, you decide. In other words, we believe the toss of a coin is Hashem. And I'll give you an example. Hashem asks us to do lotteries. In the Torah, he said in the case of the inheritance of Israel, do a lottery. In the case of the scapegoat, the Siraz Azel, do a lottery. Many mystics would do lotteries. Something was called the Goral Agra. The Vilna Gon would create something called a lottery. And he would do that. When he didn't know what to do, he'd open up a Chumash in a certain way. And Hashem would tell him the answer. I'll give you a, 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 a true story about that. There was a story where the great Rav Moshe Feinstein, Rav Moshe Feinstein, asked one of his colleagues, could have Aharon Cutler to come with him to America and to start building up the Jews in America. 
And if Aaron Cutler didn't know what to do, on one hand, he wanted to follow the great Rebbe of Moshe Feinstein. On the other hand, he wanted to live in Israel. Like any, all of us, he wants to live in Israel. So what should he do? He really didn't know what to do. He said, you know what? Let me ask Hashem. And he did what's called the Goral Hagra. He did literally the way the Vilna Gon asked you to turn the Chumash and turn the Tanakh. And, and he did it in a certain way, the way you're meant to. And it came to the following verse. You ready? This is what God told him. By Yomer Hashem El Aharon. God said to Aaron, Leich El Moshe Bamidbarah. Go to Moses in the desert. Go to Moses in the desert, meaning he literally was told the answer. And that's why he went to America with Moshe Feinstein, which is called the desert outside of Israel, the Midbar. And so the question is, why don't we live our lives that way? Why don't we live our lives? But if we don't know what to do, let's ask God. And the answer is, if anyone wants the message in an answer, why do you think we can't do that? Anyone on Facebook, give me an answer, Zoom, an answer. Why don't we live our lives like uh, by the flick of a coin? Just keeping us because Hashem is in charge of the lottery. That's why it's called Purim. Wouldn't it be nice just to kind of bypass our free will and just ask questions, just find out the answer from Hashem? One of the answers is that we're not allowed to rely on a miracle. We're not allowed to rely on a miracle. We don't have prophecy anymore. And therefore, yes, in, in previous years when we had the first temple, we didn't know what the answer. Sometimes the Kohen Goddess, Hashem, Mishpat, the breastplate would light up. And Hashem would say answers. But nowadays we don't have that. And Hashem wants us, therefore, to, to try and work it out. But sometimes to ask sages, I say like a rab, to ask, to ask our rabbis to try and, as we're going to see soon, connect to intuition. But unfortunately, we're just not holding there. We're just not on that level, essentially. We're not on that spiritual level, unfortunately. But in, in, in theory, certain mystics are on that level. And that's why they do it. And that's the first part of tonight, that the idea of Purim is Hashem's running the lottery, Hashem's running the show. What's going on in Ukraine, Russia right now is exactly, for whatever reason, which we don't know, Hashem's decision during Adar, during 5782, it's happening now. This is all the last moves of the chess match before Mashiach comes. We're getting to the very end game right now. It's the very, very end game. And every move that's happening, as we spoke last, last week from Prices going up, the Talmud and Sotov, page 49, explained that's one of the conditions before Mashiach comes. And, and essentially, this is exactly, we're exactly where we need to be. We're all exactly where Hashem's put us right now. And everything's Hashem. Something very, very important to, to understand in your life. The, the homon, when things happen, wants you to look at things as coincidence. Oh, that was a coincidence that I got. Have you ever been in that scenario where you just bumped into someone and, and you met someone and through that, something really good came out? A job came out, a relationship came out. So that's obviously Hashem. There's no such thing as a coincidence. I had a friend of mine who was traveling in a bus in India called Doron. This girl comes in, a girl from Essex called Zoe, walks in the bus, sits next to him. They start talking, and that's it. They realized very soon later they were soulmates. Turned out that she actually wasn't Jewish. He was, and we got to know them, and she wanted to convert to Orthodox Judaism. In the end, she brought him back to, to Orthodox Judaism, all because they sat next to each other in a bus in india because it's not random when you're really channeled and this is a little clue for you when you're really tuned into hashem when you're on point when you're holding when you're really flowing then literally all the things around you nothing's coincidental literally emails coming in messages coming in it could be who you see in the shops who you sit next to on planes nothing's coming be always aware have, have your eyes open always to Hashem's providence. That's lesson number one from Purim. But now let's talk about drinking and then we'll connect it to the first part. So why do we drink? What's the whole shtick of drinking? Normally drinking isn't the best of behaviors to do. First of all, there's a Talmud in Erevin, page 65, which says the following. If you want to find out what Simon's really like, the Shlosha Devarim Odom Nikar, three ways you can recognize the real person. The koisoi, the kisoi, or the kaso. With how he is with his drink, how he is with money, and how he is when he gets angry. And they all come from the same root word, chaf samach. That, that the word for anger is always is connected to the word for drink and the word for money. Meaning what? And if any of you are single, I would recommend you do this. If you want to find out if the person you're dating or will date could be your soulmate. 
first of all, see how they are with their alcohol. Because it's very interesting. When someone starts drinking, in vino veritas, as they say in Latin, which means wine sets you free, which is really learned from the Gemara. So again, Latin is just stolen from, from Judaism. The Gemara's phrase is nichnas yain yotzosov. Wine comes in, secrets come out. And more than that, the gematria, the numerical value of yayin, yud yud nun, is 70. The numerical value of sod, samach vav dalit, 60 plus 6 plus 4, is also 70. Meaning wine and secrets are the same. If you want to find out the truth, the, a, a way if, if you're not sure if someone's being honest with you, apply them a bit with alcohol, like a truth serum, and find out the truth. Now, my dear friend, Hashem wants to find out the truth about me and you. He wants to give us a chance that the real us has an opportunity to connect to Hashem. So that's why over Purim, the goal is not to drink whiskey or vodka or cocktails or Iraq. The goal, my friends, is to drink yayin, which, by the way, the Mispah Katan, the Maharal says is seven. Seven plus zero is seven, which is obviously connected to Shabbos. There's, there's this element of Shabbos on Purim. There's this is element of the number seven when you drink wine, which the real truth comes out. And therefore, says the Talmud, the way to find out what someone's like, how they do with alcohol, because unfortunately, when someone, when someone drinks, and by the way, speak, we'll speak soon, James, if someone can't drink, what you should do to achieve the same levels of transcendence, which we're going to speak soon, because there's many people that can't drink. One of our students that can't have alcohol. So we're going to, we're going to speak about that soon. How someone is in their drink? Because unfortunately, some people are very, very ugly drunks. When they drink, they start getting angry. They start getting super animalistic. They start getting rude. I've got news for you. The, the mystics say, the Kolbo says, and this is for all of you now, sorry to spoil your fun. If when you drink, you're not going to become a nice person. It's going to bring out the animal in you, not the angel in you. Don't drink. Just have a little sip. But don't get to a place when, God forbid, the animal comes out. That's the last thing we've got. The last thing. You know, if, 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 if when you drink, if when you, you should be drinking um, wine, sweet, ideally if you can, when you drink, it's just high, you've got to have white yayin. When we drink, if you're going to drink and become animalistic, God forbid, throw up, that's, that's on, on Purim, and that's, you're going to, your head's going to be in the toilet. That's not the point of Purim. The point of Purim isn't for your head to be in the toilet. The point of Purim is for your head to be in the sky with Hashem in a very, very high place, which we'll see soon. So be careful for those of you how it is you drink. What, what's going to happen when you drink, number one. So many of you maybe shouldn't be drinking. Number two, there are the two things, just very briefly, how someone handles money is another interesting way. Someone could be looking very nice, but some, all of a sudden when they have money, they're not, they could be miserly, they could be tight, they, they can't be sometimes that level of kindness that they're pretending to be when it comes to either drinking or money, or if they lose their temper, you know, how someone is under stress is another way to really find out where someone's holding which is really interesting. Those three things, you'll, you'll really see if someone kind, compassionate, patient person, or have they gone to the dark side? That's, that, that's an important litmus test. But let's try and understand why we drink. So here's the point. You ready, everybody? It says in the Talmud, you've got to drink Adelo Yoda, then Arohomon Laboroth Mordechai, another quick numerical value. This is one of my favorite ones, the numerical value of Arohomon is actually 502, which is the same numerical value as Baruch Mordechai, which means you drink till you understand there is no difference between Arohom and Baruch Mordechai. Why? Because everything's Hashem. But that's very deep. It's a very, very, very deep concept. What does that mean? It means the following. It says, Ad Telo Yoda. What is the word Yoda? My friends, generally in life, Hashem asks us to use our intelligence, to use Das, to use logic, Normally, we're meant to be using logic. It says in the Torah, you should know Hashem. Maimonides says that, that that's key mitzvah of Emunah, to actually get to a place of Lodas Hashem, to know. Normally, in, in life, we tell people to be rational. Some of you, if you saw, I put Rabbi Tatsis talk about how to make decisions out on, on our channel. 
anybody hasn't signed up, please subscribe to J Network 613. You can see just the last video we put out was Rabbi Tax, how to make decisions. That was, it's a very logical process, weighing things up pros, weighing things up cons. We're normally meant to do that. By the way, anyone who's the, the muzzle of a Virgo would be excellent at that. Normally Hashem's created based on the muzzle. Some people are more attuned. Some people have a greater propensity to being able to be super logical, academic, rational. Normally that's a good, good thing. Apart from Purim, on Purim, Hashem asks you to go to a higher place. To explain in Kabbalistic terms, there's something called a Rotzain Tafton and a Rotzain Elio. We have a lower will and a higher will. The, the, the mind, what you're probably doing when you're listening to me now, is you're probably, your, your, your brain is probably very, hopefully, thinking and attentive, and, and you're probably trying to analyze and be thinking at the same time as I'm speaking. But there's a higher way to understand, which is to go to a much higher place, what's called the Rotson Elio. They may explain how Yoshev Soloveitchik defines this Rotson Elio. You ready? He defined, I found in his writings, he writes like this. He says the Rotson Elio, or should we say the Rotson Tafto, and he says, that's deciding by reason, balancing credits and debits, weighing alternatives, measuring consequences. It's an, an analysis which is painstaking and time consuming. But your Rotson Elioin is intuitive, dynamic, aggressive, passionate. It bursts forth with fervor and emotional intensity. Its insights and higher affirmations are inspired with the breath of divinity with which every man is endowed. The Kabbalists taught that the Rotzayin Elyon belongs to what's called Keser. In the Sfirot, you have the 10 Sfirot, and on top of that, you have the crown. You have Keser, which is our link in to the divine. It, that's on top of the head. That's where we put our tefillin. That's where we put our tefillin over there. The crown rests on top of the head. The brain underneath it is the seat of Chochmah and Bina and Das. But above that is the Rotzayin Elyon. Under it's Rotzayin Tafto. But the crown, however, towers over the intellect. It's not governed or motivated by that which is underneath. It starts with awareness of the cognitive world that leaps beyond it. It wills, why? Because it wills. Defying any attempt to explain the, the process of will. It's the real I. Meaning, who are you, my friends? It's a little bit deep, but why not? Let's go there. Who are you? Who is David? Who is Alon? Who is James? Who are you? Are you your thoughts? Mm-mm. You're not your thoughts. You're not how you process your thoughts. That's just the mechanism. That's your rots and factor. The real you, as James said, the godly soul, but the godly soul in you is, is that intuition. It transcends logic. It's the Adolo Yoda. It's the Kesser. It's, it's the you in Hashem. It's, it's the ultimate you. It's the high you. It's that you when you're standing by the Western Wall and you feel emotional. You just feel a connection. You just know what's right. I always tell people when you're in that space of rots and Elyon, then you can ask yourself any quandary, any dilemma, and you know the answer. You just know the answer. So we're normally we're in the we're in just in the dark, in a place of confusion, murky, confused. Like, do I go right? Do I go left? Do I do here? Do I do that? What do I do next year? We're living in this world, but in the world of Rotson Elio, there's no confusion. And our job is how do you access it? So Purim is a day when Hashem has the open doors and allows you to come. Exactly. As David said, when Mordechai and Homel are the same, when, when, they're, when you're no longer rationalizing, when you're no longer got your bias, when you've no longer got your skepticism, your cynicism, maybe your triggers of, of, of the, the things which give you trauma, in your rots and Elyon, you're fine. You're beautiful. Now, by the way, for those people who can't drink, one way you can try and reach your rots and Elyon is through prayer and meditation. And I definitely recommend over Purim that you, you have a bit of solitude and you go to a really beautiful place where you breathe in and you breathe out and you clear your mind and you start channeling and you start maybe davening, you start talking to Hashem and you start praying or whatever you need to get to that, what's called rots and Elyon, whatever you need to, to get out of your head and get out of your stresses. If you think about it, a lot of people drink just to stop the worries of life and to get away, to run away. 
ironically, there's a point. The point is the real you, the real you is your rotz and el you. So Purim is trying to get you to the real you. Now, how do we do that? There's, there's a ta- there's Rav Kook, the great Sadiq Rav Kook says that when we say Lechadodi on Shabbos, we say Lechadodi on Shabbos, we say Pnei Shabbat Mekabla, the face of Shabbos we're receiving. We welcome the face of Shabbos. What does the Shabbos face look like? What does it mean? The Shabbos has got a face? So Rav Kook explains, because my friends, we have two faces. People are two-faced. We have the face of our stress, our rots and tactone face, our stress face, our confused face, our, our perplexed face, but then there's the real you. On Shabbos, I get to see people's eyes much more. They're much more, they're, they're sparkly, they're bright. The, the real them, the Pnei Shabbos is your face. That's your face. The real you is your Shabbos face. So in a sense, that's what we're trying to achieve on Purim, even though it's in the week. And even though, you know, we're not resting, but we're getting, it's another opportunity to get to your Shabbos face, to get to your higher face. Let, let's go on. There's, the, there's an amazing book, my friends, written by Avraham Avinu. Do you know that? Abraham wrote a book. You want to know what it's called? You want to message him? What's the famous book that Abraham wrote? The first ever. Kabbalistic books we have that Abraham wrote. It's called Sefer Yitzira. Sefer Yitzira, you can probably look it up in, on, on the internet now. Can you imagine? And in it, Abraham explains, Avram Avinu explains through, through prophecy from Hashem, the different energies of every month. And he says the following. He says, not only is diff- every month on energy, this month is the sense of laughter, schok. There's a letter for every month as well. And the letter, anyone know what the letter for the month of Adar is? The letter for the month of Adar is the Kuf. Is the Kuf. Why Kuf? Says Rav Tzadok Cohen, this is really deep. Watch this. It's another way to access the real you. The words Kuf in, 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 in Hebrew, a Kuf, Kuf, Fe, Kuf, Vov, Fe, means a monkey. It's the month of the monkey. What's the spiritual benefit of being a monkey this month? Why does God want us to access monkeys this month or to emulate and imitate monkeys this month? You ready for this? This is crazy stuff. There's a Talmud in Baba Basra, page 58, that says the following. It says, That just as a monkey imitates man, we've got a monkey from James there, James is already connecting to the energy. Just as a monkey imitates man, we have to imitate Hashem. Let's try and understand. Let's try and understand. What do we love about monkeys? Why do you take the kids to see monkeys? Because the kid starts playing around with his arms and the monkey starts imitating. Monkeys can imitate. They are renowned for imitation. Says Rav Tzodzik HaKohen, this month, more than any month, we have the ability to imitate Hashem. By accessing the real you, we can imitate Hashem. What does that mean to imitate God? It says in, in the Torah, for you need to walk in his ways. Our job is to emulate God, just like Hashem is compassionate. We're compassionate. Do you know what's happening, my friends? When we're giving out gifts on Purim, when we're giving out charity on Purim, we're emulating Hashem. We're imitating Hashem. It says Hashem keeps the Torah. Do you know that? Whatever that means. Hashem puts on tefillin. Whatever that means. I'm not going to go into through that. But Hashem keeps the mitzvot. And when we keep the mitzvot, we're emulating Hashem. When you're kind and compassionate and patient and sympathetic and, and generous and charitable, you are activating the godliness in you. And here's what Rav Tzodik says. There's two monkeys. Let's get complicated here. There's the koif hakodesh, the holy monkey. And the koifa koton, the vulgar monkey. And it's up to us which one we're going to imitate. And in our life, unfortunately, we spend most of our time not imitating God, but imitating anything but God. We're imitating celebrities. We're imitating sports stars. We're imitating people with the latest fashion, dress. I don't think anyone's imitating politicians nowadays, but... But, but they're definitely imitating 
anything but Hashem. Our job, my friends, is not to be, is not to imitate that which is in the lower world, but to imitate Hashem, which means imitate godliness, imitate holiness, imitate goodness, imitate spirituality, imitate that which Hashem wants. And with the way to do that, one of the ways to do that is to follow your natural instincts, your higher instincts, your intuition. And that higher natural intuition is almost that which you were born with. It's not amazing when baby is born, they're innocent, they're beautiful, they're holy, they're breathing healthy, there's no stress, there's happiness, there's joy. And then we get older and we start making life so complicated. We have this trauma and that trauma and we're so sad and we're depressed and we're anxious and we're in pain. And the truth is, and here's my blessing for you, on Purim you can get back to your innocence. You can get back to your true, natural, godly self. That's the real you. And then if you do that, from then on, it can be life-changing. You can learn how to access that higher, true, genuine part of you whenever you want. Most of the time we get so miserable because we're caught up in this delusion of life when everyone's imitating the wrong monkey. We're, we're not... We're not monkeying around correctly. We've got, to, we've got to imitate the holy monkey. We've got to be holy. And that's the real you. And my friends, so many of you might be right now in a, maybe after this talk, or should I say maybe before this talk, you're in a dark place, you're in a low place, you're in an upset place, you're in a sad place. You didn't think there was any solutions. Purim comes along, but not before. Everything can turn around. Everything can turn around just like that. But one of the ways you can turn it around is actually you have the answers to your problems. It's in you. When you were born, you had the natural state of joy and happiness and health. And we can all go back to that natural state if we can reach that Ratzon Elyon, which is the Keser, which we can do either when you drink or you can do it through prayer and meditation if you want instead the energy will be shifting in that direction. There's an amazing piece of Talmud, my friends, a very deep piece of Talmud in, in, in Tractate Megillah, page seven, which says there was a famous Purim party and it said Rabba invited Reb Zeir around to his party and in the middle when they got so drunk, Rabbi it says, got up and he murdered Reb Zeir, the Shochtei Reb Zeir. he killed him. You know, Sivan, don't worry. Sivan's coming to my party tomorrow. I'm, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't act like that. You, you're, you're fine. But, but it says Rabba went and he actually killed Reb Zera. And he saw Reb Zera's dead and he tried to bring him back. He didn't come back. So he had to dove into Hashem. And a miracle happened. And he, thank God he got resurrected and he came back. Says so the Talmud and Reb Zera managed to walk out there breathing, living and breathing. And then uh, ironically, the Talmud, which is just full of irony and humor, says next year round, Rabba said to Reb Zera, oh, we had such a good time last year. Would you like to come back this year? And Reb Zaira said, um, if it's okay with you, I'm like, prefer to live right now. I can't rely on a miracle every year, was Reb Zaira. And what is going on? Like this great Sadiq, who's great rabbi, he's allowed to go and kill someone on Purim, God forbid. So obviously it doesn't mean that. Lubavitch Rebbe says something so deep, so deep. And he's explaining, this is the point of drinking. Point of drinking was rabbi knew how to get to this place of Keser Elion, this place of Rotson Elion, place of Keser, but he did it very dramatically. He did it actually having an out-of-body experience where he was totally fused with Hashem, a bit like it's like in the afterlife. He got to that state of the vapors, of that oneness, of that love, where they were clinging to each other, almost literally out of the body. Rabban knew how to come out of the body and then come back to his body, which by the way, Yaakov Avini knew how to do that. That's why it says Jacob never died that Arizal knew how to do that. That's why that Arizal asked that after he was dead, he should be able to, his body should be left on the mikvah, on the steps of the mikvah. So he wanted to come back into his body after he died and go into the mikvah himself and then come out again, which is what he did. Rukhan Vital put the Arizal's body on the steps of the mikvah, went out, 10 minutes later came back and the Arizal's body was soaking wet. So the Arizal knew how to come out and come in. Reb didn't. Reb didn't know how to come out of his body and come in. But essentially, the goal of Purim is to become totally in love with Hashem, to become totally absorbed in Hashem, that there's, there's nothing else. 
There's just Eno Bilvado. There's just nothing else. There's just you and Hashem, and we do it via music, and we do it via drinking, and we do it via dancing, and we do it via eating, and we do it by giving charity, and all those things can propel you if you know how to connect, if you know how to access that energy to the most incredible joy, the most incredible joy. And that's why Sfok, laughter, is very much the energy, is, is very much the energy of this month. <sighs> Let's continue. Lots to do tonight. The Baal Shem tells us something very deep about that piece of Talmud. It says, Kom Rabba Veshofte Ribzeira. Rabba went and killed Ribzeira, but it means something else. Rabba means great, Ribzeira means small. Says the Baal Shem Tov, normally in life, and some of you who are my students have told you how to do this before, we go very slow. Normally, normally we move spiritually step by step, one step at a time, right? One step at a time, one step at a time. Says the Baal Shem Tov, Purim is the time, Kom Rabba Shafte Reb that now is the time for great strides, not time for small steps. Rabba means great, Zera means small, meaning Purim's the time, and this is what I'd like you to do, to really dream big, my friends, to dream huge. When you hit that place of your Kesa Elio, start again, when you're in a low place, when you're in a, 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 a sad place, when you're in a low state place, a stressed place, it's very hard to dream big. It's very hard to have a, have a true, genuine vision about what you can achieve in life. Don't you, don't you agree? On Purim, my friends, it's going to be a time when if you dream, you'll be able to see a panoramic view. You'll be able to genuinely see how, how much you can achieve in life. The real you, you're now in a place of the real you and you'll be able to see your real future because those doubts, remember Amole is numerical value 240, which is a fake doubt. If you're really tapping into Purim, there should be no more doubts. Hopefully, if you get to this place of Kesser, then that's the higher you, that higher intuition. When you're in a place of higher intuition, you can dream big. And what I really recommend, my friends, listen up, what I recommend is that you make a dream and you ask Hashem to help you achieve your dreams. And you make a resolution which is a bit dramatic. Normally, I always say, like, one step at a time. Purim is a time for big steps. That's the idea of Kom Rabba, the Shafi of Zera. It's a time for great strides, not small strides. And what I recommend is you find a time on Purim, which is just you and Hashem, and you make a resolution. And you think, what is something I, I can now take on in my spirituality? What is an area I can emulate you, like the monkey in me can emulate God, uh, emulate you, God, in a better way? What is it you can do better, this, this Purim? And make that resolution and then obviously try and live by it and then that Purim would have changed your life forever because you'll have not just hopefully moved one rung but maybe you can move five six rungs this Purim so I really recommend that and not only that it says in Shulchan Aruf the following one shouldn't normally during the year if someone asks for charity we're, we're allowed to like ask who are you we do our due diligence we look it up we make sure we're not being conned all apart from Purim on Purim, if someone goes like that, you just give them money. This is really important. Over those 25 hours of Purim, if anybody comes to you asking for money, you've got to give something. Just give something. The says in Code of Jewish Law, we shouldn't check or investigate about the poor who come to us. We should just give whoever requests. You don't have to give a lot. You can give 50 pence. You can give a pound. You can give a very small amount, but give something. And then it says like, like, like this. And therefore, says... In Psalms, Hashem Tzilcha, Hashem is your shadow. Hashem imitates us. Hashem mirrors us. And therefore, when we put our hand out to Hashem, Hashem will absolutely give us. Just like we are mimicking Hashem, Hashem mimics us back. It's very deep, this whole monkey business, right? On one hand, we're imitating Hashem, and then Hashem imitates us back based on our imitation. So if we are now get to a place of unconditional giving, then guess what? You go to Hashem with the, the things you want in your life and you open up your hand. If you've been giving, Hashem will absolutely give you. Hashem will give you, absolutely. As it says in Talmud Megillah, Kimu lemala mashikibu lemata. Heaven acts in, heaven will act as we act 
they, they act up there as we act below. Very important principle. We finish off with, with a parable, and then maybe I'll, if there's time, a story as well. Start with a parable from the great Sadiq called the Slana Mareba. He says the following. A king was moved to a new palace. All the precious items of the old palace had to be transported to the new one. This created a serious problem because the king's most precious items are generally kept under heavy guards or locked up securely. And how are we gonna risk taking them on a wagon to a new location? The king also had many secret documents whose contents can, can't be reverted to the public. How can they be brought? So they didn't know what to do. So what should they came up with a solution? What about the crown? The king's crown, how are they gonna move the king's crown? So they came up with a plan. They put the crown on a simple wagon. He covered it with straw. So no one would guess that the crown was there. In this manner, the crown was delivered to its new location securely. My friends, the crown is called Keser. That's what's going on in Purim. It's the holiest and holiest of days, but it's very concealed. So that's why you can go to work. It's not Yontif. People make parties, there's music, there's food, but it's because the holiness of Purim is so great, it needs to be concealed from the Yet Sahara, whose desire it is to steal it from us. There's something called the Klipot. It's very, it's why I, it breaks my heart. There's so many crazy Purim parties, there's raves, there's all sorts of stuff, which is anything but Purim. That's why I call Homon's Revenge. You know, it's Homon parties, not, not Mordechai's parties, unfortunately, because the, the, the clipper of Purim is so strong because the the holiness is so immense. So the kese, the king's crown, is manifest through the whole day, but it's concealed. But my friends, we can access it if you want, just, just by simple prayer. A simple prayer, say, Hashem, I love you, I'm sorry. Do to shiva, you can do repentance. The way we do repentance on Yom Kippur, you say sorry for things, and you make a resolution to make a change in your life. And then you ask for the things you want for you, your family, ask for what's going on in Ukraine, Russia. Let's really hope Hashem makes the shift, just like everything changed so quickly in the Purim story. They were thought it was destruction. Hashem just turned it on its head. Please God, Hashem will try, turn it on its head, this Purim, and, and the war will end. Let's hope. I'm really hoping for that. I'm governing for that. Thank you so much, James, just reminded me about the Gregor and, and the Dreidel. So the great Sadiq called the Bnei Yisosva says, what's the difference on Hanukkah, we spin the dreidel. On, on Purim, we, we turn the Gregor. He says, what's the difference? Hanukkah, it's top down. Purim, it's bottom up. Meaning what? In Hanukkah, it's Hashem. It's coming from up, up above. Hanukkah is overt miracles. Crazy miracles happen. The, the menorah lasted for eight days. God is putting the work in as such. And we are being spun around. Purim, my friends, we do the spinning. The, the spiritual energy comes from us. Hashem wants to see you can eat, you can drink. Are you going to do it for me or do it for you? Are you going to be spiritual with it or animalistic with it? It's up to us to create the spin this time. It's up to us to create the miracles. That's a very deep difference between Purim and Hanukkah. I just want to finish off with one of my favorite stories. Purim is all about what we call hidden miracles. So I just conclude with this. It's one of my favorite stories of hidden miracles. It's from the book, Sports, Small Miracles in the Holocaust. And you can check it out. And the story goes like this. Any of you have been to Auschwitz, you'll have seen the train tracks coming in. And many, many, many of us were on those carriages, come out carriages. This woman came out of the carriage wearing a fur coat. True story. And the Nazis are laughing at her. And to the left is the gas chambers and to the right is you get to work. And she was waiting to be told and they looked at her and they said, left. You don't need that where you're going. And they laughed at her fur coat. You're not gonna be taking that. We'll take that, thank you very much. And they took her fur coat. And she went off to be gassed and they put her fur coat in this area called Canada, which all Jewish valuables were put. This fur coat was now lying in, Canada, in, in this space called Canada and two Polish workers 
saw this coat, which was unlike any coat they'd seen because this coat was moving up and down, up and down. The coat was breathing. They realized something was in that coat and they went to the fur coat and they saw there was something hidden inside and they opened up the lining and it was a newborn baby. A newborn baby girl was in that coat. The mother, like many stories, they try and hide their babies and she hid a baby in her coat. And this specific Polish worker said, it's a present from God because she couldn't have children. I'm going to claim this is mine. And then she did something quite pretty disgusting. She went, she cut herself terribly. She started bleeding. She started screaming. Ah, I've just had a baby. I've just had a baby. And she was taken out of Auschwitz, this Polish worker, with her newborn baby, which was really the newborn baby of, of a Jewish mother who was just tragically killed. This baby grew up. 32 years later, she's now a doctor in Poland. And she's now standing at what she thought was her mother's funeral. And she's walking away from her mother's funeral. And her aunt taps her on the shoulder and says, my dear niece, something I've wanted to tell you for 32 years, but now I feel is the time to tell you. You should know the truth. Of course, your mother loved you tremendously. and She's been a great mom. She's not your biological mother. Your biological mother was a Jewish woman who died in Auschwitz. We found you in this place called Auschwitz. We sh you should know where you've come from. And our, our heroine, our Jewish baby, who's grown up to this Polish doctor called Sarah, now starts looking at her. and says, are you mad? Are you, are you ill? Are you vulgar? What are you doing? Are you tra traumatizing me on my mother's funeral? You're telling me this. What proof do you have? You must have some proof. Can't just tell me that. What proof do you have? And, and the aunt's thinking says, the only thing I can think about is when we found you, you had a very special necklace around your neck with some strange letterings on. I'm sure your mother must have kept it somewhere. And that was it. Sarah's now shooting off to her mom's house, looking through her jewelry box, trying to find some a necklace she's never seen before. And lo and behold, at the bottom of the box, she chances upon this beautiful necklace with gold letters, three letters. She feels a little bit drawn to it. She puts it around her neck, but she's now really confused, this poor woman. She's confused, doesn't know what to do. Is it true? Is it not true? What do I, what does she do with her life? That summer, again, chances, that's the whole Purim thing, one coincidence after a coincidence, she chances upon some Israelis who were there where she was having a summer holiday. And she says, oh, Jewish people, let's chat to these Jews, tell them about my story, show them my life. My, my, my necklace and she went and showed them the necklace she said what does these letters say and they said actually it's hebrew something called hebrew and there's three hebrew letters there's a sin and there's a race and there's a hey called sarah sarah and she goes well that's strange that's that's my name but how do i know how do i know if it's true if it's not true what do i do with this does that mean i'm jewish am i now jewish is that it am i sarah the jew and the Israeli said, listen, don't ask us, but there's a very great rabbi in New York. His name is the Lubavitch Rebbe. Let's go and ask him. He would know what to do with this. So we're going to, next time we're going back to America, we're going to go, Tim, for you. They took her number down and all her details. And two months later, they called her back and said, we now finally spoke to the Rebbe. And the Lubavitch Rebbe says the following, you're 100% Jewish. It's true. But the Rebbe said a very important message. He goes, you need to be in Israel. He goes, his line was, we need doctors in Israel. So a true story, this Sarah who survived the Holocaust has now gone to Israel and became a doctor in Hadassah Hospital, fell in love with a fellow doctor and was building a beautiful life for herself and everything was going so beautifully, so happily. Seemed it was she was going to live happily ever after. Until tragically in 2005, she's sitting having a coffee in Sparrow Cafe in a coffee shop in Jerusalem. On the day when a terrible terrorist attack happened there and a bomb blew up in the coffee shop, many were killed that day. But thank God not Sarah, she survived. She lost some of her relatives there that day. She was a real hero and she started scurrying the patients from the hospital, from the cafe to the hospital, and she's now back to the hospital. 
and she sees an old man who starts saying to her, please help me, please help me find, help, help me find my, my granddaughter. I've lost my granddaughter, she's at the cafe. See if you can find her. And she said, sure, what does she look like? And, and he starts describing what she looks like. He says, anything else to go by? And he says, yeah, she, she's got her necklace with, with, her, with her name on. It's fine. So she runs back to the coffee shop and she's now looking for this, for this young girl and she chances upon the girl and she sees the girl and she sees the necklace and it's the same necklace as hers. It's the same necklace and she doesn't understand. Different letters, it's the same necklace bought from the same shop. And now she's really intrigued. She's like, what is going on? I've never seen another necklace like mine ever till this moment. And she's now taken the young girl back to the hospital to see this old, old man and says to the old man, where did you buy this necklace from? And the old man said, you can't buy that necklace. I made it myself with my own hands. One was given to my daughter who died in the Holocaust. And another was to my granddaughter. And at that point, true story, Sarah and her father were reunited. 60 years later, do the maths from, from 1944 to 2005. Hashem managed to allow them to spend the last few years of their life together. Where, where Sarah and, and her father were reunited. Amazing, amazing true story. To show you that in the end, we'll understand how life unfolds. Everything's Hashem. And there's hidden miracle after hidden miracle after hidden miracle. But in the end, we're all going to be able to give Hashem a hug. We're all going to be reunited with our Father in heaven. We're all going to be reunited with truth. Hopefully it will come soon with Mashiach. But we should know that however tough life seems, that the blessing's just around the corner. In fact, it's already happening. The real you isn't that lower monkey. The real you is, is your higher self. And that which looks as obstacles and as challenges is really Hashem in disguise. And that's why... We wear masks to show that we know you, that Hashem is wearing a disguise and we see through your disguise. When you start realizing that Hashem wears a mask, then he, has, he just takes off the mask like he did to Sarah and just revealed. He let, he let Sarah and the father be reunited. And that amazing blessing of providence, please God, can happen for us too. So I wish you all a very, very happy Purim, really beautiful Purim.